And now, with Sound Investing, here's Paul Merriman. Well, it's great to be back again with uh, just Chris today. Uh, Daryl's out on the road somewhere, and uh, uh, he'll be back with us uh, next month when we do our uh, monthly Q&A. But today's special for, for, for a, a couple of reasons. Uh, uh, first of all, before we get into this, the information that uh, Chris Pedersen, our director of research, is going to bring us all about the best in class uh, ETFs. Uh, uh, this is, I mean, truly, this is, is exciting for me. I hope it, I hope it is for many of you. But before we go there, I have to give a personal a note of gratitude to Chris because he has uh, very kindly uh, allowed us to offer his book, Two Funds for Life, uh, free as a PDF. And Chris, um, good to see you and, uh, and, and, and certainly happy to tell folks that, uh, that your book is now available uh, at no cost in a PD yeah. format. So uh, just take a few a few minutes and and tell our folks about the book. Well, it's it's great to be here as always with you, Paul. And um, the it's also really nice to think that people who may have hesitated to get exposure to the book because of the cost uh, will have a chance to at least crack the cover and take a look at it. It really is a it's a deep dive into the two fund for life strategy. Uh, I, I'd like to think it's accessible, but for people who like all the numbers and the charts and the graphs, they're in there. Um, I tried to answer all the questions I needed to answer for myself to make sure it was a prudent strategy. And so that means it's pretty thorough. And a lot of the questions people come to me and ask are answered either in the text or in the in the appendix. And so in, in many respects, it's kind of like an owner's manual for the two fund for life strategy. If you like it and you're going to pursue it and you want to stick with it, uh, it aims to answer all the questions you'd stumble on along the way and hopefully keeps you committed to it and keeps you on the path. Well, I know there are a lot of people using the two funds for life strategy because I get, uh, uh, emails, uh, thanking us for the work that uh, that you've done. Uh, and, and I think somewhere on the website, uh, you have a page where there's a collection of uh, questions and answers that you've addressed. Uh, uh, can, do you know where that is specifically? Uh, uh, on Under portfolios, the pull down tab on the website, there is a two funds for life section. And so a lot of that content is there. I'll be working with Margie this year to update that and uh, make it a little bit more aligned with the book and more current. But yeah, there's a lot of Two Fund for Life information there, as well as some videos you and I did. Okay, that's wonderful. Well, as a matter of fact, I think next to the the video about the, the 12 best Vanguard funds for retirees, your Two Funds for Life video has gotten the uh, uh, the, the most open. So uh, thanks for the work and thanks for uh, allowing us to make this free to everybody. Well, and by it's, been, the way, it's been a fun tag team. We did it together. So. Well, I, I, it was, it was, it's been great fun. And, uh, and, and I might suggest the favor for us that you can do once you have gotten that PDF is to pass it on to as many people as you know, uh, that might benefit from that. So, uh, uh, that that's great. Now on to the topic of today, which uh, is is in some ways one of the most p powerful kinds of work that we do in terms of helping investors, because it, this work can be used in so many different ways. We're going to be talking uh, about the best in class recommendations that Chris has created. And uh, you, you've been doing this for how many years now? Uh, it's probably five or six. It's been a and, while. <laughs> and, and and I know there are a lot of people that are using your work, Chris. And and the reason that I say it's it, it, some of the most meaningful work in terms of helping people is that in a sense, you could totally ignore all the other good stuff that, that we're working on here. You could ignore our asset allocations. Uh, you could hand select amongst uh, the, the different major equity 
asset classes, all the different ways you you might want to put them together. As a matter of fact, you could read the article that uh, the White Coat Investor has entitled 150 Portfolios Better Than Yours. And actually, it's over 200 now. That article was written in 2014, I believe. And it has uh, portfolios, suggested asset class combinations from dozens of folks like ourselves. And, uh, And if you chose some other strategy and some other other combination you could still use the recommendations that uh, that Chris has made for the ETFs and and in a in a sense it's a lot more work to doing what Chris does for the best in class uh, in, in in terms of understanding equity asset classes that we try to help you do that's pretty easy in terms of building the portfolios a lot of work went into that, but once you've got it, there's not anything more than theory to do. And uh, and then all the work that we do in combining fixed income with equity, uh, there again, the, uh, well, Daryl, of course, updates all that information each year, and that takes time. But what you do uh, with the best in class, and maybe a good place to start, Chris, is just to take people through uh, the process in, 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 in a way that they'll understand that this is a lot of work and why it is a benefit for having you doing that for them. So to just take it away any way you want to explore this topic. And, uh, and I've got some questions I know I'm just going to wait patiently to ask. So, so uh, give, us, uh, give us a little history and, and take us through the process. Well, feel feel free to interrupt me as we go. I don't really have a presentation to make, but uh, it started when I first came to the foundation and started looking at your content. I could see that you had a Vanguard set of recommendations and you had a Fidelity set of recommendations and a Schwab set. And at my brokerage, I could get access to pretty much any of them. And I was thinking to myself, why do I want to stick with one family? Uh, don't don't I really want to just pick the best, the best of the best? And so I approached you with that idea and you thought it was a good one, especially with ETFs. ETFs are widely available. And so then we went down the path of trying to figure out, well, how do you how do you characterize them? How do you decide which ones are best? You know, we our portfolios are built around the idea that small is going to beat large and that value is going to beat growth. And so Typically, that means you want the smaller of the, if you have two funds, you take the one that's a little bit smaller, the one that's a little more value keep the expenses low, uh, look for a lot of holdings. Um, low cost uh, is also going to kind of drive you towards index funds or things that don't have some wizard behind the curtain trying to do magic and and charging you more money for it. And um so the first couple of the first time we did it, I think it was sort of around that kind of a strategy or that sort of thinking. And then as time went on, I applied a more quantitative approach where I, I uh, was able to figure out ways to look inside a fund's history and say, well, how much of its return came from its tilt towards value? How much of its return came from its tilt towards size? Uh, how much of those premiums am I getting? And if that's consistent, so you know, you can actually figure that out. If it's historically been consistent, we would kind of expect the same exposure in the future. Well, what would the expected return be? And that led to this approach where I basically analyzed the factor predicted returns for these candidates in each of the categories. And um, and that's really I've talked about that on some other podcasts and kind of the nuts and bolts of how that works. So I don't want to get into that here. But um, why don't I start by sharing? I'm going to share the portfolios that we um, we aim to populate. That's really where this all starts. Mm-hmm. Um, so when Daryl runs his back tests and you talk about strategies, um, what we're talking about are these portfolios, and these are available on the website under the portfolio pull-down tab. The very first thing is what are our recommended portfolios? 
And you've heard about all of these. There's the ultimate buy and hold, the worldwide four fund, the US four fund, the worldwide all value, US all value, worldwide all small value, US all small value, um, the S&P in small value, and then some two fund for life strategies. And for each of these, they draw on this set of asset classes over on the left-hand side, or some people would call them styles of equity funds. But so, so I'm not looking for the world's best dividend ETF because we don't have a dividend ETF. I'm not looking for the world's best commodities ETF because we don't have a commodities ETF. But I am looking for the best ETF for US small, large cap blend, large cap value, small cap blend, small cap value on through our, our assets. And so that kind of sets up the framework. And, and this is important. These allocations you see in the chart are the allocations that Daryl uses when he back tests the strategies. And these are the allocations we would expect somebody who wants to use that strategy to use when they implement with a set of funds. And you can actually see, I've kind of tipped my hand, you can see the updated list of best in class funds here. But, but before we go to that, um, let me just talk about again, you know, what is it we're looking for in these best in class funds? So uh, by the time this podcast goes out, this is the content that will be up on our best in class recommendations page. And um, it's going to mention that we have updated the pies and we've updated the portfolio configurator. And the there's really one one major change, and that's that we removed the um, what was the uh, the recommendations for the for the international large cap value, we changed it from the iShares MSCI EAFE EFA value fund EFV to the DFA international value fund. Um, it's got a lower expense ratio. It's got more holdings. It's got better value. Uh, it's got a better factor predicted return. It's got better historical performance. It's it's just better all the way around. And we tip we we sort of projected that that recommendation was coming a year ago. So people could have been adopting it already, um, but we waited to get a little bit more history. And we also try not to whipsaw people. We only update these once every two years. So um, so that change uh, is now in the set. Um, and then the other change is that we've, uh, we've got now emerging large cap value and emerging small cap blend, both, both listed as best in class recommendations. Now we don't actually have a portfolio that uses emerging small cap blend. So um, why have a best in class recommendation for it? Well, the reason is that I wanted to kind of do a tie break between the candidate funds we had there. That was part of it. And then there may be people who want to use a combination of 5% emerging large cap value and 5% emerging small cap blend to approximate an emerging uh, markets part of an all small cap value portfolio. So, um, so those are the changes. Uh, those are the top ones. Uh, can, can I just I, bust in here with one? Yeah, yeah, please do. Uh, because somebody who's new to, to our work may look at this list and say, now, wait a minute. Uh, where's the growth? I mean, where's the beef here that, that we all know about how great growth is? Why don't I see anything that says large cap growth? Well, there's there's uh, fundamentally you have to kind of pick you have to pick a strategy, uh, and if you if you build a portfolio that has growth in it, it's going to offset the value that you have, and um, and over time you're going to look more and more just like the market at large. You really haven't made a choice, <clears throat> and so if you if you look if we go back to the portfolios and we look at how they're constructed, they have large cap blend that includes some growth and some value, but we don't have large cap growth, which would exclude most of the blend and all the value. And the reason is that the value has a higher expected long-term return. So, so growth isn't in there for a reason. It's, it's just not aligned with the strategy. And it's not aligned with the strategy because we don't expect it's going to perform as well over the very long term. Now, we know recently it did great. So there will be periods of time when uh, 
you know, the choice you have made, whatever that is, you may be a growth investor, right? <laughs> there will be periods of time when you wish you were a value investor or vice versa. But over the very long term, uh, it seems like you're more likely to be happy tilting to value than growth. And uh, as you say, there's growth in the blend, whether it's large cap or small cap. Uh, and and the S&P 500 uh, is part of that large cap blend. Yep. That is the fund. So, so, and that largely is driven by huge growth companies uh, uh, historically. So you do get some growth. Yep. Uh, I, I'm, I'm curious again, just for these people who are new to our work, if you had a portfolio that is, is large cap uh, blend uh, about how much of that large cap blend would you say is represented by those huge growth companies that we're familiar with? Well, it, it, growth growth and size are different things. So uh, everything in a large cap blend category is going to be a, a very large company. <clears throat> um, I don't know what percentage of a large cap blend fund is growth. Uh, I know that the fund that we choose, the Avantis fund, probably is has a lower percentage in growth because it leans in the direction of uh, of smaller and and value just a little bit, but enough to we think give you an edge over the long term. And so far, in recent years at least, that seems to have been borne out. And we will see that in a few minutes, I think, because I saw some of your other the style boxes. Yeah, will give us an idea of how much growth is in the portfolio. Yeah, in fact, um, that's probably the next place to go. I mean, we well, just talked- before we do, before we do, okay. I just go back up there for one sec because you've got these alternative recommendations. Oh, that's right. Yeah, so the alternative recommendations uh, these include a lot of funds that uh, are part of other families. So for example, we have an all Vanguard ETF portfolio recommendation. So all of the Vanguard funds that make that up are in this list. <clears throat> and uh, we have other funds that we have recommended as part of family portfolios uh, that that uh, are also part of this list. I wouldn't say that they are equal in quality I would say that they um, they're in there as the alternatives because sometimes people don't have access to the best in class. And so uh, we've tried to anticipate some of those situations and think about what would be available in some of these areas where we think the, the selection will be more limited and and uh, found the best option there. Yeah. Well, and I'm not going to bury people with numbers, but I, I, when I think back to what you said early on in this conversation about not wanting to be uh, limited to only Vanguard or only Fidelity, because uh, it it appears there are there are some ETFs that are configured in a way to be more likely to be more profitable over the long run. But just for fun, Chris. I took a look at the U.S. A large cap blend group here, and 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 that Avantis fund. Now, one year does does not a lifetime make, but the Avantis fund last year uh, was up down. I'm sorry, down thirteen point eight. Uh, on the other hand, the S and P five hundred uh, was down about eighteen point two. Now that is a huge difference, uh, and and that difference, I, from everything you've taught me, uh, has come because of that loading, if you call it that, of some mid cap companies and 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 more value. Uh, and if I I looked at another asset class, that's small. Uh, 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 if I can just inter interrupt yeah. briefly there, Avantis also values profitability or the quality of the, the financial quality of the companies. <clears throat> and that uh, could also be something that played into the the difference in performance. But like you said, it's only a year. There'll be years when it goes the other way. So I'm not going to I'm not going to crow too loudly about that. Yeah. Well, let me just say that's a uh, that's a topic we ought to address a little later if we can get back to that because I sure. think it's really important. 
I also noted because we have a lot of people who ha have heard us say small cap value about a million times that the uh, Avantis uh, small cap value fund last year was down 4.9. Uh, the, the and the people at Vanguard have two to choose from, I think, maybe even more, but they were down about 11. And and so the, the differences sometimes can be can be pretty doggone meaningful. And I got to remind people that we don't cheer very much when we've lost money. But I feel like cheering if I think that the money you lost was 5% instead of 10%. <laughs> Because in the long run, you win more if you don't lose as much as somebody else. So, so that that I think is uh, uh, very. I think it's interesting. So let's let's uh, go on and move forward, like you suggested. Yeah. So uh, we've talked about the changes. I also like to analyze the impact on the portfolios and look at how they how they add up when you sum it all together. And I use Morningstar for that. So I go there and I enter these new portfolio allocations and I do an X-ray on them. And it produces these style boxes, which are kind of interesting. It's a three by three grid with uh, value uh, core, or you can think of it as blend and growth going horizontally and vertically. It's going from large at the top to medium to small. And uh, I do this for the Vanguard, the DFA uh, portfolio, which we've used as a reference historically. Uh, and then I compare the 2021, the last set of recommendations to the 2023 recommendations for the ultimate buy and hold. And then I show the uh, four fund combo US and worldwide and the all value worldwide and all, val uh, all small value worldwide. And so, you know, what you see here is that um, Vanguard in an ultimate buy and hold portfolio ends up looking, it's tilted towards value, but it actually has a, its core, its center is actually up in kind of large blend. Um, the DFA reference uh, shifts more towards value. It's shifted to the left. And um, both the 2021 and 2023 best in class ETFs are still shifted to the left and maybe a little bit down, you know, so you get a little bit more of a, a value and size tilt in those. Um, and then the, uh, so I, I guess the other piece is to look at in terms of the changes from, let's focus in on the changes from 2021 to 2023 best in class ETFs. The price to book ratio went down slightly from 1.15 to 1.13. The average company size went down slightly from 8.6 to 8.36 billion. The expense ratio went down slightly from 0.26% to 0.25%. And the yield went down slightly, which uh, from point from 2.58 to 2.55. So tiny differences, you know, and, and this may, you know, come into play as, as we talk about the next thing, which is, you know, should you switch? Uh, hey, because that, that always it, comes up. Yeah, let's just spend a, a couple more minutes on these style boxes, because in the process of trying to teach people about how investing works, it, these style boxes are one of the best teaching tools uh, that, I, that I know in terms of understanding how the academics break down their, their, their view of, uh, of, of the, the differences between these uh, particular asset classes. And by the way, the other thing that happened between 21 and 23 is you do get changes in the market itself uh, in terms of, as the market goes up, you, you can have the price to book ratio uh, uh, changing over time. It, um, and of course, then at, what's important then well, well, that's just to be clear, though, although that's true, I rerun this analysis with all of these portfolios with the data from January 31st, 2023. So so that change in the market attributes over time gets gets wiped out. I try I try to get rid of that because you're right. That would make the comparison suspect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, how difficult for people who and I know some of our people who follow our work 
know how to do this. How difficult is it for uh, the, the the beginner to learn how to take the funds they're in or the ETFs they're in and build their style box so they can see how their portfolio compares to the portfolios that we're recommending. You mean how difficult is it to uh, to create a Morningstar x-ray? Exactly. I think it's pretty easy. I, I mean, the first time I did it, I don't think it took me half an hour, maybe, maybe 20, 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's free. By the way, for those of you who are not uh, subscribing, the, taking the, the free subscription from Morningstar, you are missing w- one of the, the richest sources of, uh, of, of data. And uh, uh, as you know, we have our truth tellers, the people that we've that we think are really special in terms of the information they're bringing. And two of those truth tellers, John Reckenthaler and uh, Christine Benz, uh, are with the Morning Star organization. So I, I hope it is a site that uh, that you'll get to know. Did you have any other questions about the style boxes while we're here? You know, uh, just just to, again to help people as they look at this. When, when I talked a few minutes ago about those difference in returns, uh, last year, uh, those companies with uh, lower price-to-book uh, ratios uh, did better in the market. Uh, and so when I look at the Vanguard price-to-book at 1.41, Versus the uh, the best in class, let's say at at one point one three, that's you know close to a thirty percent or let's call it twenty five percent difference. Th- that's a meaningful amount from your research, Chris. I assume, um, and and it would it be fair to say that that that's a quarter of a percent, maybe even a half a percent, a difference over time. I I think that would be a, a reasonable kind of expectation for having a portfolio that's better constructed, tilted more towards small, more towards value. For people who want to dive a little bit deeper into this cross-section of returns topic, I'd point them to chapter five of my book, where I have a table that lays out what the historical returns have been for each of these nine boxes. Oh, great. Uh, which I I think is really interesting. And it also uh, has the drawdowns that were experienced from 1972 to 2021. And uh, one of the things that you take away is that the smallest return is this bottom right-hand box, the the small cap growth. And it was at 10.53%. That was the nominal return. Still a good return, but it was small. But the the real gotcha is that that return came with the highest drawdowns by far Mm. at 64% worst case drawdown. So uh, that bottom right hand corner is a danger zone. And uh, later on, when we look at the configurator, the updated configurator, you'll see how all of these portfolios kind of they create an arc, like trying to avoid that danger zone. It's really interesting. Yeah. And I I think people if they if they don't know why that tends to happen uh it it's pretty easy to see that growth companies people get really excited about them. and it's they the, pay it's the promise the dream the dream and they're yes. willing to pay outrageous prices then when they find out the difference between the honeymoon I'm sorry the courtship the honeymoon and reality <laughs> then uh, uh, those things can, as we've seen, many of those companies uh, in the last years fell 80, 90 percent. And so uh, and those were big growth companies, by the way, that that uh, that that happened, too. So and just one more. There's one more thing on this page that I get a lot. I'm sure you do, too. And that is uh, why should I pay twenty five basis points, a quarter of 1%, when I can invest and only pay one-tenth of 1% or even less uh, uh, if, if, if you wanted to, 
Uh, and, and I just want to make sure people understand those return differences that, that you've tracked, that is after the expenses, correct? It, it is. The, the projected returns and the historical returns they're based on uh, include expenses. Uh, so the reason you would spend an extra uh, 0.15% is because you expect to get another 1% or 2% returns. Uh, so, and that is my genuine belief that the best in class ETFs should outperform if the future looks like the past well more than enough to cover the 0.15%. It may come with a little bit more bumpy ride. Yeah. You know, that, that's, that's something to consider. But the flip side of that coin is I guarantee you, and I can't oh. guarantee you many things, but I guarantee you that if you use the Vanguard portfolio instead of the best in class ultimate buy and pull, hold portfolio, you will have lower expenses. I guarantee you that. That is that, that is that's good. I like that guarantee. And that's that's why some people may may prefer that. Uh, I have friends who are very knowledgeable. They know all of this information, and they're still invested 100 percent in Vanguard funds. Uh, for two reasons. Number one, they know that the expenses matter and they want to keep them low. And number two, they trust Vanguard. You know, Vanguard is mutualized. They're owned by their investors. They only behave in a way that is in the investor's best interest and uh, more power to them. You know, I wish them the very best of luck. Well, but the other side of that coin is all of these ETFs in the best in class list are available through Vanguard at, with, 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 with no commission. So you, you can still get them at Vanguard. And, and uh, as we talked a little bit recently, over at Fidelity, uh, you can get all of these best-in-class uh, ETFs and buy and sell with partial shares, which means you don't have to figure out how many shares you can afford with the money you got. You can just say, give me $1,000 worth and you'll get 19.256 shares. That's really a, a, a big deal. But uh, uh, even if you're at Vanguard, you can take advantage of these recommendations if you wish. Well, we should probably move on because I think we already have a three-sided coin here because we <laughs> used that analogy three times. So, uh, <laughs> all right. So one of the very first questions people are going to ask is, should I switch? I mean, there's not that much to switch this year, right? There's really just one fund. And uh, I, I will say that DFIV is uh, among the changes we've made one of the more worthwhile. I think DFIV versus EFV is a substantial upgrade, but there's costs involved with changing. If it's in a tax deferred account, it's probably less of a concern, but if it's in a taxable account, I would you know slow down, think carefully. How much are you gonna lose in the trade? How many years is it gonna take you? You know, Let's just swag a difference. Let's say it's a 1% difference in return. How many years would it take? to pay the the tax bill and get you back to break even. So, uh, you know, and also, do you have confidence in the, the new recommendation? Um, you know, have you done your homework? Have you gone and studied it? And, you know, I, th I think we, we have a lot of confidence in DFA as an investment provider. Uh, so uh, I would imagine a lot of our listeners do too, but um, you really should invest in things that you've built your own confidence in that you can stick with for the long term that you think is going to serve you well and and prudently consider the changes that the the costs of making those changes. So uh, I I always hope that people won't just willy-nilly snap and automatically follow that they will will take a moment and and uh, think about it first. A uh, couple other questions that will be on the article um, will we be updating the ETF custom allocation calculator? Uh, we've had an ETF custom allocation calculator for a long time, but the portfolio configurator really replaces it and is better. And so I'm not going to be updating it. The good news is you can go in and change that fund on your own. And if you've been using it to use it, you had to make a copy to your Google Drive account, you'll still have access to it. 
So um, I think most people will be better served by the portfolio configurator. And um, I'll just, since, since that's there, I'll just pull it up really quickly. This is what it's gonna look like. This is with the new allocations. Um, so if I go ultimate buy and hold and uh, pick, uh, we'll go tax deferred and use the best in class ETFs, you'll see that it's got the new recommendation DFIV in there. And if we uh, go back to ultimate buy and hold and, and look at all of the uh, all of the portfolios, you can see how they line up and you can compare them. And you can look and see that the best in class is the smallest and the most value-y. Um, these are both best in class, taxable and tax deferred. And then you, you, know, you get Vanguard up here and Schwab. And so you can go and look and you can compare and see how they did. There is a change here. I, um, I changed how I calculate the average market cap to align with the way uh, Morningstar does. They use a geometric mean. So uh, you can read about that in the glossary on page two, but uh, without getting us into, into the weeds, this will be available and, and I think it'll provide useful information. So That's great. Thank you, by the way, for that, Chris. That, that's a great, a great tool. It's, I, I, think it, I think it's working out pretty well. Um, Another question that comes up a lot, you know, what if I don't have access to all the funds? Uh, there's a little story here that kind of walks you through what somebody with a really limited selection would have. But the gist of it is you kind of want to think about what your priorities are. Uh, you know, do you value size most or value most or geography most? Those are sort of the three dimensions on which these portfolios are calculated. And then you just start substituting and figuring out how to... Um, how to fill the gaps in a way that respects your first priority and then your second priority and your third priority. So um, it's, well, it's really art. Just, it's really art. <laughs> why don't you remind them just, just at this moment uh, what your three priorities are so that they will be reminded how they might be most productive themselves. If, if it was me, I probably would, val I would, I would uh, prioritize value first size second and geography third that if 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 it was me that's the way i would do it because the premiums kind of lay out in that order um there really isn't much of a premium for international uh, we do expect emerging markets because they're more volatile to have a higher return sometime <laughs> you don't know when but sometime um so there's a little bit of a little bit of a return boost for that, but there's really not an expected premium for international versus U.S. Um, and That's the premium. A big deal. What's what, that? You, what you just said, Chris, is a really big deal because this is a struggle people have. Now, do I have to have international to get the value? You said number one is value to get the value. Number two, can I get the size in the U.S.? Do I need international for size? No, you don't. Uh, and and then number three, you, you get this. Yes, you get this diversification. Um, but in essence, the diversification th that is there has has more to do with with the value of currencies. And so you can have a, a period where the dollar, for example, is real weak. It's been really strong for some time, but it could be very weak, in which case the those international currencies will, will will make the holdings in those international funds more profitable. But it isn't about growth. It's about a currency change. The, um, the way I look at internationals is that they are, they're an insurance policy against something catastrophic happening in the U.S. Uh, and, uh, you know, Knock on wood. Um, we're gonna, we're you know, gonna keep keep the the hopes alive that that won't happen. But um, there's history is replete. It's full of um, examples of where catastrophic things happen that are unexpected. And uh, so, if you have everything in the U.S., even though those con companies have a large international presence. If something systematic happens wrong with the country and its property rights, then that international doesn't protect you very much. And again, it's extremely unlikely, but 
uh, if you had some international in that situation, then it would provide some level of insurance or protection against that one catastrophic point of failure, so to speak. So I view the international as a, a prudent hedge against that one concentrated risk. Yeah. And, and to be fair there, that comes at an extra cost. It does. Uh, it, it comes a little bit of tax cost in some cases and 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 also a little, little bit of higher expense ratio yeah. sometimes. Yep. Yep. And, it, and it also, the same liquidity. Yeah. It, it also comes with uh, a little bit of a discount in a way, though, too, because the U.S. market, because the U.S. market is so widely respected for its good property rights and its historical good returns and safety and regulatory environment. Uh, people pay a premium. You know, you pay a higher price to earnings multiple and price to book good multiple. Point. Yep. Yeah, so, very good point. Yeah. Let's see. So the last question, you know, why don't we include all in one funds like AVGE and multi-factor funds like VFMF and target date funds? And part of it's just I only have so much time in the day. Um, but part of it's that, you know, we want to keep the message simple and actionable. So we have a set of portfolios that require a set of assets, and we recommend funds for those assets. AVG is, GE is a fine fund. It's an all-in-one global worldwide uh, fund that tilts towards small in value, but we don't have a portfolio that uses an all-in-one fund. And it doesn't tilt quite as much as the ultimate buy and hold portfolio. So. I have trouble recommending it instead of the ultimate buy and hold portfolio. It's still a good fund. You know, I, I don't have any problem with it. And VFMF is a multi-factor fund that actually looks a little bit like a large cap value fund. In fact, it has a little bit higher return per unit of risk than the fund that we recommend. But it's not a large cap value fund. It's got a higher level of active management in it. Um, so... There's not really a spot in our portfolios to recommend it, but that doesn't mean it's a bad a bad fund. And people, I, you know, I know people uh, admire our work and thank us for our work, and then go off and do their own thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I mention this because I don't want people to think just because I didn't list it or didn't mention it that it's a bad fund. Um, and then target date funds, you know, limited selection. There's a lot of times people don't have a choice, and Vanguard's pretty widely available. So. Maybe someday, if I get a lot more bandwidth, uh, I'll analyze target date funds. But for now, I, I think we do our back testing and anal analysis with a Vanguard like allocation. And I think that's probably helpful to people. And if they don't have a Vanguard fund, the other one's going to have a lot of things in common with a Vanguard fund anyway. Great. Yeah. So um, I think I think that's it. You know, it's it's relatively simple. So, so the in the in the coming weeks, uh, we will have the cal the investment calculator, the lifetime investment calculator, will be updated with new data. So we'll be able to, uh, and we'll have the fine tuning tables. You're going to have to give us a maybe another month before all of this will be uh, complete. But but we're getting there. And uh, but by the end of March, I think all of this uh, information that we update on a on a, a regular basis, some of it annually, and uh, uh, and as Chris has already mentioned, he looks at these every couple of years. Uh, it is a it is an interesting question, uh, Chris, and, and I have it about the work that my wife and I have gifted. Uh, money to grandkids with the idea that they they should leave it where it is, in essence, for the rest of their life. Uh, and and uh, how do you emotionally uh, think about the idea of putting money away, whether it's in an Avantis fund or a DFA fund or a Vanguard fund? Um, if, if it could be true to its asset class, um, can you see somebody actually owning that fund for the rest of their life, other than taking money out or adding some fixed income because the uh, the fund itself is too volatile? But um, 
How do you think about investing for the long term? And how does that fund differ from owning IBM stock or Google stock or Tesla? Yeah, I I think uh, all of the best in class fund recommendations we have, I would be comfortable using as a, uh, I'll call it a, in some respects, a placeholder for that asset class for the long term. Uh, thinking that if the fund, a lot of times when funds close, they get subsumed by other funds that have similar management. You always want to be careful and look and see and see if it gets you know, passed into an asset class you're still happy with or a, a management style that you're still happy with. But uh, I would hope that these will last a very long time, probably not a lifetime, but that they'll last a long time. And then, you know, somewhere along the way, somebody will evolve them into something similar. Um, the difference, of course, between these and a, a stock is diversification. Uh, these all have hundreds, if not thousands of stocks. And so you're not, you're not vulnerable to that idiosyncratic volatility and risk that comes along with just a single company. And uh, that provides some safety with the same expected return that you get for the the similar the similar companies assuming that they have similar financial attributes yeah i think i think the the risk in a sense of being able to have it be a lifetime holding is uh and i think this happened to some of the vanguard uh funds uh they they attracted so much money that they, uh, and I don't know this for a fact, but it appears to be this way, that they ended up owning an, a larger average size company. And, and uh, it, it, it may be that uh, what one would want to do in 30 years, let's say, for example, the Avada small cap value fund grows to where the average size is twice that. And that's, this is true of Vanguard. They are two and three times bigger companies than you get in other small cap value uh, funds. But if you've learned your lessons well, uh, and Chris, I think you're doing a great job of teaching, you will know how to identify the ETF if that's the way that they're presented to investors 30 years from now. But you'll know how to evaluate uh, those funds that do in fact have smaller companies maybe more deeply discounted and 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 that's part of the process that we hope that uh, our work is going to help and there's there's a desire to figure out how how do how do we continue to give you this information particularly to those of you in your 20s when chris and i are no longer even around to give you this <laughs> these recommendations but i just want you to know we're working on that because uh uh, I, th I think this kind of work, particularly if it can remain free to people uh, and help them on their own build a portfolio that is just as good as anybody you might have paid 1% to uh, or some actively managed fund, uh, th th that's why we're here and that's how we're trying to help. And uh, I, I hope you'll choose this presentation as one you share with your friends. Uh, about the work that we do, because again, this is this is work that could be used without any of our our uh, our portfolios. Just to know that these are great uh, ETFs. And Chris, thank you so much for taking the time to to do all this work. It's valuable. Thank you. Well, it's it's always a learning process too. So I I, I enjoy I enjoy that part of it, and I enjoy the questions that come from our listeners. I learn a lot. A lot from the challenges that come our way. We've uh, I've learned about leveraged funds. I've learned about uh, commodity funds. I've I've learned about negative momentum in small cap value. I've learned about a lot of good things from our listeners, and I appreciate that. Um, so keep them coming. All right. Good luck to all of you, and we'll see you next week. 
It's Paul Merriman with Sound Investing. Sound Investing, soundinvesting.com and paulmerriman.com are produced and exclusively owned by Paul Merriman, who is solely responsible for their content. For more information, free articles, mutual fund recommendations, and more, visit paulmerriman.com.